part two of spiritual uh, gifts. We're now in Romans chapter one, and we're going to look at a few other things with regard to uh, the gifts that God gives uh, or doesn't give and, and how he uses them. You are uh, familiar with the transition period, the dispensation, uh, how there are things like the supernatural bestowal of unnatural gifts and then the supernatural energizing of natural gifts. And you have to keep that in mind and the time in which God does these. And also those gifts which were temporary for the transition period and those gifts which are permanent for the rest of the dispensation of grace. Those that are genetically oriented, those that are uh, semi-genetically oriented, it's just for the male of the species, and uh, those that uh, we have in and of ourselves that can be used uh, for the Lord. Now, rem uh, remember that the book of Romans and a couple of these other uh, uh, verses of Scripture that we or portions that we'll look at were written during the transition time. Now, the reason that I say that is because we don't have an itinerant apostle coming around to grace churches, laying his hands on people, bestowing gifts. And yet that's exactly what the Apostle Paul did. He would go around um, ordaining elders or pastors in, in the local uh, churches. Uh, uh, but again, remember, time is marching on through the book of Acts as he was doing these things. He would get people saved, then he'd swing back and come through these towns, and they would have a viable church there, and he would bestow these gifts. And uh, not only on them, but also some of these temporary gifts. That's why in Romans chapter 1, Verse number 11, it says, For I long to see you, Romans, that I might impart unto you some spiritual gift. Now, that's the system at the time. The Apostle Paul would go uh, around, and also he had secondary apostles uh, that had power such as this, that could go around establishing people in the faith by giving people from the midst of the congregation, these spiritual gifts. Some would be for helps, helping others. Uh, some would be for administration. Uh, some would be for the working of miracles. Some would be for tongues. Others, the interpretation of tongues. And um, all of these worked and functioned at this time. Note the reason for this, verse 11. To the end ye may be established. Now, we learn that these temporary things give way to the permanent gifts. In the dispensation of grace, the way that you are established is by doing just what you're doing now, growing in grace and applying doctrine to life as you are. Now, as I say that, I'm not talking about your orneriness. I'm not talking about illegitimate things, uh, carnal things. I'm talking about as God sanctifies your life in your body, those things that you have been given by, by way of your parents genetically, those things that interest you naturally are the things God uses to bring him glory. Now, at this time, it wasn't that way. Paul would give these gifts. Why? Because they didn't have them. It was not a, a, a natural thing that they had in their genetic structure. It was an unnatural gift supernaturally bestowed. The reverse is true today. It's a natural proclivity, supernaturally energized. And there's the difference in the system. Now, I hope you realize as we turn to 1 Corinthians 1, that what I'm telling you is going to help you as you read through these and protect you from those people who say, do you know what your spiritual gift is? and you search your heart, and you search your life, and you go month after month, year after year, and you don't know what it is, and you can't find it, and you begin thinking, I must be carnal. I must be out of the will of God because I don't know what my spiritual gift is. And might I just tell you that there are no such things except evangelist and pastor teacher for today. But I can tell you this. You are gifted in your own right of God through genetics. And your genetic structure is important to God because you now are a member of the body. And as the eye is important, the eye is not the total body, but it's part of the body who functions as it is, an eye, the ear, the nose, and so forth. And as you find yourself in this natural setting, all your responsibility is, is to learn doctrine and sustain spirit filling. And God will use you as you are. That's the fantastic thing about 
uh, how things work in the dispensation of grace. Now, okay, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, uh, verse 1. Paul introduces himself to the Corinthians. They already knew him. But he's uh, talking to them who are sanctified in Christ. In other words, they're members of the body. That's positional sanctification. Um, and they're called to be saints. <laughs> There's also experiential sanctification. The uh, Corinthians were not very saint-like, though in the body they were sanctified ones or saints. Now he's thanking God uh, for them and so forth. Verse 6, uh, the testimony of Jesus Christ. Now, the testimony of Jesus Christ was confirmed in you. Now remember, he uh, got to the Corinthians about the uh, middle part of the transition period. And uh, so all of the books of the Bible were not written as yet. And know what he says to them. So that you come behind in no gift. Now he corrects the abuse of some of these gifts from chapter 12 through chapter 14, especially focusing on tongues. But in chapter 13, he says there is a more excellent way. It's not here yet. It is knowing in part, and then you'll know uh, in toto. Uh, it is functioning through a glass darkly, but then face to face. There's a temporary system and a permanent system. But he's referring to the temporary system. You don't have the completed word of God, but you do know about the rapture, the coming of Christ. And from here, as you progress in time, you have to have ministry gifts, enablements. And some of those things, um, uh, the Paul is saying, he bestowed. Uh, the testimony of Christ was bestowed in you, uh, confirmed in you rather, so that you become behind in no gift as uh, uh, you wait for the coming of the Lord, who shall confirm you to the end. And that's what these gifts were for, confirming disciples in the faith, uh, getting them established in the faith, the word of God was not totally in existence as, as yet. And so therefore, Paul would impart gifts. And these gifted people then would minister to the local bodies until uh, the, the normal routine, the, the order uh, for the um, uh, dispensation of grace would come into existence. Now, let's look at even the gift of pastor-teacher. Early on, as we turn to 1 Timothy chapter 4, Timothy was saved during the first missionary journey of the Apostle Paul. In the second missionary journey of the Apostle Paul, he took uh, Timothy with him on, on that journey. Therefore, we are right smack dab in the middle of the transition period. Note how Timothy got his Domata gift. This too, it doesn't happen that way now, but it happened that way then. Verse number uh, 14. Neglect not the gift that is in you. These are the pastoral epistles. Timothy was a pastor of the church at Ephesus, which was given you by prophecy, preaching, and with the laying on of the hands of the presbytery, of the elders, in other words. And uh, Paul further clarifies that in 2 Timothy 1.6, if you'll turn there. Verse 6. Wherefore, I put thee in remembrance that you stir up the gift of God which is in you by the putting on of my hands. So, the temporary way of doing it was having an authorized apostle to lay hands on a person, impart to them the, the Demata gift. But as the uh, apostolic gift died off and the more uh, permanent system was uh, uh, installed, the, uh, the uh, Holy Spirit through, uh, or Jesus Christ through the Holy Spirit now gives these gifts. At one time, it was actually bestowed when the elders laid their hands or other pastors laid their hands on a, on a, um, a pastoral candidate. Now it is just a symbolic move that we identify with them. Now, uh, for the first time, we have invited um, other churches other than the Bedford Church and our, our church to the Gostov House. And uh, the church that we invited was the church down there in Kentucky in Litchfield. They have a good uh, group down there. And we went down and ordained a fellow by the name of Floyd Frank. 
Now, it's difficult because he has two, two first names, or, uh, but uh, anyway, Floyd Frank, and he's, he is just a humble, sweet man. He, he's never had much training. He was, he was brought up by older pastors. Sometimes I think that is, a, that is a good way to go. Brought up by older pastors, and uh, he believed that uh, God had called him to be a pastor. And so he called me on the phone, and we gathered to some of the men of the region, and he said, uh, Denny, would you please chair uh, my ordination council? And I said, I would gladly do that. So we went on down there, and, uh, and talk about a hoot. It was a riot. Um, because many of the men there were the older men that have trained him, and they all had hearing aids that were going off at the same time. And uh, I would say, you know, uh, Brother Francis, it's your turn. Huh? What? You know, Bro- Brother Jim, it's your turn. What would you say? And then we got Francis got into it with uh, with Dave Wilson over a over a theological question, and so those two back back across the table were arguing with one another of which of what was right. So finally, I got things under control, and we ordained this guy. And uh, the way that we did it was, I called them forward. He knelt in the front of his congregation. We all got around him. I put my hands on his head. Everybody else touched his shoulders, and we prayed for him, committing him to the Lord's service. Now, did we impart to him anything that he did not have before? The answer to that is no, we didn't do it. It was symbolic. It was ceremonial. We were identifying with him because we believe in him. I think he he is going to make those folks uh, a good pastor. But we didn't impart anything. However, did they impart things under the transition period? And the answer is yes. I put my hands on you and imparted to you the, the PT gift. Uh, during that time, that's how it was given. And you must make these distinctions. It can't be done now. It was done that way uh, originally during the church's infancy. Okay, enough on those. Let's go to Romans chapter 5. We're going to move from spiritual gifts to the gift of salvation. Romans chapter 5. Now the interesting thing about these spiritual gifts or about using natural gifts is that you cannot do anything glorifying to the Lord without first receiving the universal, bona fide gift of God. Anybody who has ever been saved has received this basically as God's gift to them. But it's even more special in the dispensation of grace because literally God has removed all requirements except for one, believe. I mean, even God himself cannot get you saved if you don't receive the gift. Uh, He will not twist your arm, uh, force you to open it, uh, and so forth. You know why? Because if he did that and you really didn't want it, you'd open the gift and just like so many will do on Christmas morning, not appreciate it. That's what will happen. You'll open the gift and not appreciate it. You'll end up blaspheming and you will end up uh, treading on the cross and the blood of Christ and God's not going to like you for that. Okay? But... If you want the gift, open it and receive the gift and are grateful for it. Remember, when they knew God, they didn't glorify him as God, neither were they what? Thankful. Uh, God will give you this special gift. Now, six times in this portion of Scripture, Paul mentions the gift. Verse number 15. Not as the offense, uh, yes, verse number 15. Not as the offense, so also is the free gift. Here, the Apostle Paul is contrasting how this gift is given freely. Uh, If we wanted to um, uh, paraphrase this, it would be, no strings attached. All you have to do is receive it, and God will give it to you. And he contrasts that with uh, the offense. Not as the offense, so also is the free gift. The offense we get naturally, whether we want to do or not. 
The minute you were received, your great-great-grandfather, Adam, handed you a Christmas present. Total condemnation in the presence of God and headed toward hell to burn forever. Now, now there's a Christmas gift for you. And everybody in Adam, whether they chose it or not, gets this gift. You're condemned. But uh, contrary-wise, God says, look, you can have this gift if you want it. And you can have it with no strings attached. Unlike the gift that Adam gave you, I'm going to give you something that is, that is absolutely free, without charge, uh, without strings. All you have to do is receive it. And so when the Apostle Paul uh, mentions the free gift here, he is emphasizing how it is given freely. And you know, uh, that's the amazing thing. When you go to witnessing to people and you make it so simple that all you have to do is believe, uh, people want to complicate the thing. Have you ever witnessed the folks, they want to make it more than what it is? Uh, I guess it's because they, they don't want to be taken and they don't want to get caught in a scam or what have you. I don't know. But it's just simply how it's given. It's a free gift. Uh, so, but yet, uh, people do not want that which is free from the hand of God. They're too afraid. Uh, that's going to um, uh, entangle their lives. But note, there's a second time. Uh, in this very same verse that the Apostle Paul mentions this gift, for if through the offense of one many be dead, much more the grace of God and the gift by grace, which is by one man, Jesus Christ, has abounded to many. This time he mentions the gift, but it's a reflection on how it came. How did you get this gift of salvation? Did um, any of the angels provide it for you? The answer to that is no. Did the fallen angels provide it for you? No, all of them hate it. Did any man other than Jesus Christ provide it for you? No, they were disqualified as a perfect sin substitute. Well, therefore, if you're going to have uh, a gift of God that provides salvation that he would be satisfied with, it has to come by his grace. And that's why it says it's the gift by grace. God provided salvation on our behalf. If God didn't take the initiative, if God wasn't aggressive in doing this, if God didn't bring it about, it would have never come about. But because of his grace... Which, which simply means his action on our behalf giving us something we don't deserve. That's how the gift comes. It's by grace, not of works, lest any man should boast. All right, let's move down to verse number 16. And not as it was by one that sinned, so is the gift. Now, that seems to be double talk in the King James English. Actually, it's not. What Paul is attempting to communicate here is a contrast with dissimilar things. There are many similarities about, about these gifts. The one from Adam, the one from Christ. Uh, one man gave us both gifts. Uh, how, it, how it affects the groups that are, that are uh, associated with these men who give the gifts and so forth. A lot of similarities here. However, there also are a lot of differences. Note again verse 16. Not as it was by one that sinned, so is the gift. For the judgment was by one to condemnation, but the free gift is of many offenses, unto justification. So the next time he mentions just simply the gift, he is telling us what it isn't. It isn't like what happened to Adam. Now, when Adam sinned, he just committed one sin. That was it. No one else had sinned before him as far as the human race was concerned. But with that one sin, he condemned the whole human race, and from the whole human race comes, would you dare to count the sins? Trillions, zillions, who knows how many, all the consequences and ramifications of Adam's sin as, it's, uh, as uh, uh, it um, uh, adds up throughout the whole human race. So the Apostle Paul says, wait one second. 
That's what Adam did. He committed this one sin here, and it ended up in an infinitesimal number. However, the gift is not like that. The gift takes all of the sins and, and judges them all in, in one man. There, there is the difference. Adam committed that one sin, and the rest was the consequence, but here are all the consequences of sin that were poured out upon the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross. Christ took the full brunt. He took the full load. God didn't leave anyone, uh, any one of these sins out or unpaid for. God did not wink. God did not flinch. It was an unmitigated judgment when Jesus Christ took the sins of humanity. Adam just committed the one sin. Jesus Christ took all of them and paid for them on the cross. It isn't like what Adam did. But by contrasting the two as he does, you can sure appreciate what uh, Christ did for us on the cross of Calvary, not just for us, but for the whole of humanity. So he's telling us here what the gift isn't. It isn't like what Adam did. Some similarities, but it's not like that. All right, he mentions again in verse number 16. But the free gift is of many offenses unto justification. The next time he refers to the free gift, he's telling us here what it includes. I don't want uh, much introspection here this morning. We'd probably have to pass out the hankies and the Kleenexes and cry because of all the failures all of us have done in our past lives. Think, though, about your life before salvation and even after salvation, when you um, fooled around not getting serious with God, okay? Think of all the failures you've had in life. Now, I'll tell you what, make me cry, probably make you cry. But we don't want to think about it long because uh, we're not going to pass out any Kleenexes for sure. But the death of Jesus Christ on the cross thought of your sin and failure considered it as to its implications for you and for the overall plan of God, factored it into the punishment, and Christ died there. So much so that you are now said to be justified. Now, justification, uh, there's, a, there's a trivial saying. It's a sort of a cliche. It's just as if I'd never sinned, justify. And that's a little cutesy thing. But justification is far more than that. It is total compliance now with the righteous standards of God, so much so that his justice cannot judge you. Now think of that. That's what true justification is. That Jesus Christ has adjusted your failures in life, your sins and, and iniquities, and paid for them so much so that when God the Father now looks at you as a believer, he sees the righteousness of Christ. For he has made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. That's justification. We're right in every sense of the word. Uh, uh, against every norm, compliance has been uh, made through the Lord Jesus Christ. So that's what it includes. Talk about a free gift. Uh, Jesus Christ picked up the tab. Uh, he paid the tip. And, uh, and uh, we have the free meal, as it were, as far as uh, the food of everlasting life. All right, let's move on. Verse number 17. For if by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more they which receive abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness. Now he is telling us what this gift is. When you receive Jesus Christ as personal Savior, you have imputed to you God's righteousness. Now he spoke of this in chapter 4 in Romans. Chapter 4, verse 1. What shall we say that Abraham found? If Abraham were justified by works, verse 2, he has whereof to glory, but not before God. 
But what saith the Scriptures? Abraham believed God. And we have already uh, uh, contrasted how Abraham was saved and what was later added to his salvation, circumcision and so forth. Uh, But yet, originally, he was simply saved the same basis that we are. He believed, and what happened? Something happened. He received a present that he did not have prior to, to his belief. That present was righteousness. Abraham believed God. It was counted to him for righteousness. Now to him that works is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. Uh, God uh, God is, is not out to recompense us for the good deeds we've done in the flesh or being natural men, uh, children of wrath, uh, uh, our father the devil, and so forth. But to him that works not, but simply, verse 5, believes on him that justifies the ungodly. And there it is. The free gift, what does it include? It includes a total payment for our sins so that God's justice can no longer judge us. But how can that be? It is because God imputes to us something that is compatible and non-threatening to his own essence, his own righteousness. And that's what Abraham had. To him that works not but believes on him that justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. So God imputes to not only Abraham, but to us righteousness. And that simply means a right status, again, just like with his justice, in conforming to his essence or um, uh, his righteous standards. Okay, let's come back to Romans chapter 5. In verse 18. Therefore, as by the offense of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation. Okay, here we go. This whole chapter has to do with contrast, showing the similarities and the differences. When Adam sinned, the results of his sin passed to all of us genetically. When Jesus Christ paid sins dead in full, the results of that were passed to us graciously. In other words, we didn't feel its effects to us personally in in the automatic sense, but it was offered. Note again, even so by the righteousness of one, the free gift, note that it's italicized there, but the King James translators put it there to um, show that that's what's implied. The free gift came upon all men to justification of life. Now, now Paul is telling us what it did. It came upon, or literally it's being offered to all men. And uh, you know this, this past year we have had our go-rounds with the, the Calvinists and the Arminians and the struggles, so, some more than others, uh, some uh, wouldn't know all that has uh, that gone on even behind the scenes with regard to this, but you, the, the struggle there. Now, if you're an Arminian, you don't believe anything that I've just said here because an Arminian believes that he can, his salvation is kept by works. And so therefore, all of the, how, how can you believe that it is a free gift of grace apart from works and, and still be an Arminian? You cannot be. But they don't believe that. But if you're a Calvinist, you believe that the offer of salvation is just given to a select few people. The rest of us were not included in the atonement of Christ on the cross. That's why we here are biblicists and we consider uh, all that God says on the issue. But right here absolutely knocks Calvinism out of the ring. Knocks them down, TKO, what have you, because of what it did. When Jesus Christ died on the cross and said it is finished, The free gift came upon all men to the justification of life. No one is excluded. Uh, That's why, again, it is a gift, and God offers it to everyone who will have it. 
And that's the whole point here. You can't say, well, you're a non-elect person, so you can't receive the gift. That is untrue. The free gift came upon all men to justification of life if they'll simply believe. That's what the free gift did. When Christ died on our behalf, took our place. That's why the Apostle Paul calls it the unspeakable gift in uh, 2 Corinthians. He says, thanks be unto God for his unspeakable gift. And the Greek says it's indescribable. Remember the Mounds Bar where it said it's indescribably delicious? Well, that's what it's talking about. You know, you know, I've been doing a whole lot of food analogies here. I'm not exactly sure why. It must be Christmas or what have you. But it's indescribably delicious. You have to taste it and experience it in order to know what you're talking about. Thanks be unto God for his indescribable gift. It's unspeakable in the sense that only God would think of it. And only God could do it. So therefore, what it did, it came upon all men. One last thing. It's not included here, but it is in Ephesians chapter 2. Verse 8. For by grace are you saved through faith. It's not of yourselves. It's the gift of God. Genitive of possession means God owns it. Paul here is telling us whose gift it is. It's God's gift. Here's an interesting thing. Um, for those of you that uh, follow the news and especially are into computers, you understand what's going on in the computer world with regard to Microsoft and, and Congress. Because of the antitrust laws and monopoly laws, uh, Congress is getting on Microsoft because of what they're doing in bundling their products and forcing their customers to buy this and, and the other and so forth. And the reason there are those antitrust laws is because people can get so powerful and, and so forth, uh, they begin to put the, the, the competition out of business and hold the monopoly on it. Now, the minute you hold a monopoly on something, you can set your own price. And that's pretty much what they're saying. Hey, you eliminate the competition, you're going to raise your prices. No one could go anywhere else for, for these products, and you're going to make a killing. And what does he have now? It's 57 billion, I don't know how much he owns. But uh, what, what, if not the richest man, one of the richest men in the world. I think he is the richest man in the world. So they're saying now, we've got to rethink this business because if you hold, if you hold the monopoly, you're just gonna raise the price and no one's gonna be able to do anything about it. Here's the thing about God. Who owns the monopoly on the gift of salvation? God. But he didn't raise the ante and he didn't raise the price. He said, it's mine. I've got it. I sent my son, bought and paid for it, but I did it on your behalf. And if you want it, take it. There's no price on it. I paid it in full. That's the graciousness of God in extending mercy to creatures who are helpless in and of themselves to ever pay for their sins but he did it on our behalf. He owns the monopoly, lock, stock, and barrel, as the cliche goes, but he offers it as a gift to any and all who will simply believe on him and receive it.